Welcome, Age of Vintage Society. Buddy Holly stands opposite Elvis when it comes to the development of rock and roll. He was a man solely concerned with music and adaptable to different sounds. However, death would only let us have a taste of him and not the whole meal. Did Buddy Holly become an Elvis clone? I want you to know, my viewers, how much I appreciate your generous support on Patreon and your activity on the channel. These videos will not have been possible without you. Big thanks to those who watched the video until the end. Buddy Holly, the silent leader of rock and roll. If Elvis was the son of the rock and roll era, Buddy Holly was the moon, silent yet so inspiring. He did everything Elvis did subtly, the complete opposite of how Elvis acted and behaved on stage despite sharing similar inspirational sources. Elvis became the hip-thrusting rebel, while Buddy was the rebel that wasn't a rebel. Come on, look at him. What harm could a bespectacled man in a well-tailored suit do? There wasn't an iota of flamboyance in him, and he could be an interestingly shy person, but when a guitar hit his hand or he got on stage, phew, he becomes an explosive person spewing randy lyrics on stage while looking innocent. The man, in his series of movements on stage, would lie on his back, legs tucked beneath, and with a rush he would swing back up to the mic and continue singing without breaking his breath. It was swoosh, and he'd be continuing rocking. Surprisingly, his hard-rimmed glasses never seemed to fly off when he was making his moves. There's no way you'd sing rock and roll and not throw out some bawdy lyrics. It's the nature of the music itself. Elvis knew how to make the audience blush with sultry words, but what turned the head of the audience, or turned on the female section of the audience, was his hip movements. Despite the two drinking from the similar well of predecessors and listening to them on the radio or visiting certain places they weren't legally allowed to, they had different interpretations of the sounds and movements they heard. However, the two thought of merging two sounds. If Elvis was an energetic rock and roll genius, Buddy was the stealthy one. The fact that the morality police didn't ask him to be investigated by the FBI for his lyrics in Rave On, Oh Boy and Not Fade shows how disarming he is. He said the same things Elvis said, but the audience felt safe and no sexual parts were getting charged. He gave them the same lyrics as a delivery boy would deliver a romantic present, all smiles and charms, and no one is the wiser. Still, this doesn't mean he wasn't booed and called names. In Lubbock, his Texan hometown, some sections of the audience called him Turkey Neck, and this is better than him dealing with constant threats of arrests, like his counterpart Elvis did. Buddy and Elvis were great fans of R&B. But while Elvis was touted to have the soul of the black man, Buddy remained himself. He was more of a lyricist than Elvis, as he wrote most of his songs by himself, while drawing inspiration from around him. As a lyricist, Buddy was one of the most creative. The line that buzzed people in, That'll Be The Day, was from one of the John Wayne movies, The Searches being the particular movie in question. The last line of his song, I'm looking for someone to love, that line he said, drunk man, street car, foot slip, there you are, was something his uncle said. But his older brother Larry told him to use the line to make the song longer. Remember the song Peggy Sue? It was originally supposed to be Cindy Lou, although there seems to be some controversy on what was supposed to be what. However, controversy aside, multiple sources claim that Buddy Holly changed the song's title to one of the sweetheart of his drummer and best pal, Jerry Allison. Still, this doesn't mean he didn't ask for help when he needed it. Maybe Baby was a song his mother wrote for him. It wouldn't be the only song his mum wrote for him, but it was the less serious one. His mother wrote serious songs and he complained about them. He wanted something cool and silly, and she did just that for him. She wrote the silliest of songs. His mum didn't want the recognition, so it isn't widely known that she wrote for him. Also, as a rock and roller, he copied the style of African-American artists that served as inspiration for him. He used styles from Chuck Berry and Hank Williams. He watched these guys in their elements and absorbed their way with the guitar. People compared his genius to that of Elvis and would say that the talented singer was an Elvis clone. Sonny Curtis said he became an Elvis clone, but he wasn't just a clone who covered and repeated Elvis. He still had his essence. 
However, meeting Elvis added steam to his overboiling ambition, and he was determined that he would make something of himself. He made it a point of becoming Elvis's friend, and they got so close that they saw a movie together, and when Elvis got bored they went to hang out. At one point during Holly's performance, Presley even lent him one of his own guitars for him to perform with. The two are pivotal members of the rock and roll movement. Each was influential in different ways. Elvis became the face of rock and roll, or rockabilly if you like, linking African-American artists to the general public. In his own way, Buddy did the same. In fact, he went on a cross-country tour, biggest show of stars for 57, with African-American artists. Facts Domino, Chuck Berry, Eddie Cochran and the Everly Brothers. Overall, there were 96 African-American musicians, and Buddy shared a stage with them, but not without conflicts. After the conflicts were resolved, admiration began to flow from both sides, although it seemed that sex was involved in placating warring parties. However, the fun would come to an abrupt end, as some stages wouldn't allow them to perform together. The tour became an important part of American musical history, as it showed unity between the two divides. Elvis was wealthy with money, but Buddy Holly was wealthy in cultural development and influence. His influence in rock and roll was so powerful that when he died at the young age of 22, Don McLean, a notable songwriter at the time, declared the day of his death as the day the music died. His older brother Larry would not listen to the radio and couldn't for about ten years. Buddy Holly, born Charles Hardin Holly in Lubbock, Texas, is one of the musical geniuses of his time. The man grew up to reinvent what rock and roll was all about. He and his band created a situation where a band would have musical control to do what they wanted. Holly, as a member of the Crickets, wrote their songs and had freedom in the studio to do what they wanted. Interestingly, this aspect of Holly's contribution to rock and roll was misinterpreted in the film about Buddy Holly's life. Honestly, that film did a great disservice to Holly's memory. Due to how the crickets were self-contained, Buddy was portrayed as a six-feet musical dictator. This was the problem with the Buddy Holly story. Knowing full well that it would be what the public would perceive as Buddy Holly, they went on to put out something that was mostly false. By using the word mostly, we are just trying to be decent. Not one person from the crickets and the Holly family was a fan of that movie. The makers of that movie took too many liberties. Ed Cohen, Steve Rash and Freddie Bauer, the executive producer, director and producer of the film respectively, focused on making sales that glamorised some things and took too much liberty with others. So what we are going to do is try to take it from the top to dispel most of the things that they showed in cinema. So the first thing would be that contrary to what the movie showed, Buddy has the support of his parents for his music, not just his parents, his brother and the local Baptist church. The film showed that his parents were begging him to make a career change, but that most certainly didn't happen, as according to Norman Petty, the true hero of Buddy's emergence was Mr. Holly. Petty, expressing his disappointment, said, I was also disappointed because, in my book, Buddy's father is the real hero of the Buddy Holly story. He was the man who gave Buddy this tremendous strength. Buddy knew he had his dad's backing on everything he did, and the picture doesn't show the help his father gave him. His dad literally had him and his siblings learn how to play musical instruments, as while he couldn't carry a tune, he wanted his sons to be able to. It was Buddy whose musical excellence showed, as he had command over multiple musical instruments at the age of eleven. He could play the violin, the piano and different types of guitars. It was his older brother Larry that developed Holly's interest in the guitar, as when he returned after World War II, he brought home the guitar he used to entertain himself when he was a soldier. Even Larry allowed Buddy to slack off even though he was one of his employees at his tile company. He said, Nah, Buddy didn't do a whole lot of work, but I didn't mind. I just loved to hear him play, as his younger brother would sit on tile boxes and let him play. His mother was one of his songwriters and she wrote Maybe Baby for him but didn't want the recognition. Rather, the film showed his father and mother as religious zealots who didn't want him to sing rock and roll. Despite their contributions, they were reduced to mere religious zealots who were echoing the demands. The film company didn't meet the Hollies. They promised to, but didn't. They were supposed to consult with us, but we never saw the script at all. It just didn't seem to be the story of Buddy's life, not to anybody who knew him. 
His brother was even more critical of the movie studio. It didn't portray his life at all, really. They didn't ask us about a thing. It was mostly Maria Eleanor's version of his life. I didn't feel that was my brother up there on the screen. We weren't happy with the movie at all. Petty called the film a disservice, a disservice to everyone concerned with Buddy's life. The film was also dull compared to the interesting nature of how Buddy Holly rose to become the sensational superstar. Petty was even hard done by the film. He was completely omitted despite the fact that he was the manager with whom Buddy's hits were produced. He would be the one to determine what the star would wear on stage and he worked tirelessly to keep Buddy's marriage a secret as, according to him, they could lose the female fans. So if Buddy had discussed his intention to marry Maria Elaine, who he met when he went to a music publishing company in New York City, the shy Maria told him to ask her aunt for approval, which he did, and proposed to her on that date. Yes, Buddy was a go-getter, spontaneous man. Pity death didn't give them more time. The whole Petty omission didn't make sense because without Petty there wouldn't be Buddy as we know it. That'll be the day was recorded in Petty's studio and it was Petty who he went to after the whole Decker Records debacle in Nashville. In 1956 Holly signed with Decker Records and they made him perform with country musicians. The record label didn't release most of the songs they recorded nor did they promote the ones already released. No wonder his records failed to sell. Afterwards, the record label began to pay him less attention, and stubborn Holly decided he was done with labels, telling him what to do, and decided to quit Decker, contract or not. He knew he had star power when he toured with the few songs the label released. He was already getting fan mails from Brooklyn, Tampa Bay, San Francisco and Chicago. He was also getting mails from familiar territory like the small Texas towns. However, deciding to quit Decker would be a tricky thing. They had rights to the song he sang while he was under contract with them. He could only use those songs if they released him from his contracts. However, this wouldn't materialise as they couldn't come to an agreement, and this meant Holly couldn't release new songs in his name. To avoid this contractual obligation, Holly formed a band, and they worked on choosing a name before eventually settling with the crickets. It was after forming the band that they headed towards Petty, but after a while Buddy left Petty as he was broke, and the money entering Petty's grasp wasn't leaving. So Buddy decided to leave and told his band members, which consisted of Jerry Allison and others, that they should go with him too to New York. On the day they were supposed to leave, the guys decided to stay and not risk going to New York. Petty tried to convince Holly to stay too. I want my money, Holly said, and to which Petty replied, according to Maria Eleanor, I'd rather see you starve to death first. Buddy would leave and go to New York, but he couldn't reach the heights he was at before leaving, and his financial situation was getting worse. He decided to do a tour, and it was in pursuing that tour that he would board the plane that led to his death. The irony was he didn't ride the tour bus because the winter cold was making him uncomfortable. The plane he took crashed because the winter weather induced pilot error. Buddy Holly's influence can be seen in the next generation of rock and rollers. The Crickets inspired the Beatles. Buddy's The Crickets went on many tours that took them outside America. They went to England and Australia. Travelling abroad for tours wasn't something most rock and roll bands did. The Crickets would be the second all-white rock and roll band to travel abroad to England and Australia. Bill Haley and the Comets were the first. In England, two passionate young musicians, John Lennon and Paul McCartney, who would go to form the Beatles were in the crowd, and they were awed by the performance that they saw when they wanted to choose a band name. They went with one belonging to an insect. The Beatles' first song was a cover of Buddy's That'll Be The Day, and Paul McCartney tried to preserve the essence of Buddy by buying the publishing rights to the talented singer's music catalogue. Paul didn't forget the man who inspired his own greatness, despite the fact that in terms of wealth he had surpassed Buddy. The Stones was another band that had a Buddy Holly influence, and their first song was a cover of one of Buddy's songs, Not Fade Away. Dave Edmonds, Nick Lowe, Linda Ronstadt and Marshall Crenshaw are all children of Holly's style, the inheritors of his unique downstrokes on the guitar, the way he sings, and his style of songwriting. While Buddy may have died in a plane crash, like Elvis, he never left the building. His sound remains today, safe with the new generation 
of rock and rollers. What managers sometimes do for stars like Buddy Holly or Elvis is often shady. How Elvis Presley's manager made $22 million of his haters. Let's find out from this video.